Did SpaceX just execute the most shocking strategic pivot in spaceflight history? While Flight 11 marks the end of Block 2 starships, what they're doing next has blindsided everyone, including NASA. Here's the bombshell. Ship 38's final static fire wasn't just a test, it was a funeral. SpaceX just said goodbye to their entire Block 2 fleet forever. But their next move? Nobody predicted this. The demolition of Pad 1, the rush timeline to Block 3, the mysterious adapter removals. It's like they discovered something during Flight 11 that changed everything. Industry insiders are whispering about a complete strategy overhaul. Let's dive right in. So what exactly happened that Monday morning that changed everything? Picture this. Ship 38 rolling out for what everyone thought was just another routine static fire. But SpaceX had other plans. After two failed attempts, they came back with a vengeance. Instead of the typical single-engine test we'd grown accustomed to, they loaded Ship 38 with nearly full propellant tanks. Why? Because they were going for a full six-engine static fire right out of the gate. Think about that for a second. SpaceX skipped their usual cautious approach and went straight for maximum power. It's like they knew something we didn't. Or maybe they were testing something that required the full Monty. The test was flawless. Six Raptor engines roaring in perfect harmony, creating that beautiful plume we've all come to love. But here's where it gets interesting. SpaceX confirmed it was full duration. That's engineer speak for, we got exactly what we needed. But what did they need? That's the million dollar question that's keeping space analysts up at night. This successful test marked more than just another milestone. It was the beginning of the end for an entire era. As Ship 38 rolled back into Mega Bay, two that same evening, something felt different. This wasn't just another test completion, it was a farewell ceremony. Here's what most people missed. The removal of those makeshift adapter systems wasn't rushed this time. Previous flights had SpaceX scrambling to clear the pad quickly, but now they took their sweet time, almost like they were savoring the moment. The reason becomes clear when you realize Ship 38 would be the last Block 2 vehicle to ever touch that launch mount. They were documenting everything, learning from every bolt and bracket before moving on to the next chapter. But then came the plot twist. The local notice to Mariners initially suggested October 6th for Flight 11. Then suddenly, boom, pushed to October 13th. A week delay might seem minor, but in SpaceX time, that's an eternity. What happened during those seven days that required such a significant schedule shift? The schedule change connects directly to SpaceX's most controversial decision, Pad 1's future. They've made it crystal clear that the current launch mount is getting the wrecking ball treatment, but the timing reveals something deeper. Industry sources are split on this timing, and for good reason. Some say SpaceX will start demolition immediately after Flight 11. Others argue they'll keep it around as a backup. But here's the twist nobody's talking about. What if the decision isn't up to SpaceX alone? Consider this scenario. NASA's Artemis program heavily relies on Starship for lunar missions. If something goes wrong with Pad 2 during the Block 3 transition, having Pad 1 as a backup could mean the difference between meeting NASA's timeline and watching China plant their flag on the moon first. That's the kind of pressure that changes corporate strategies overnight, and it explains why SpaceX might be moving more carefully than their usual move-fast-and-break-things approach. While everyone's focused on the end of Block 2, the real story is what's coming next, and it's bigger than anyone imagined. Block 3 isn't just an incremental upgrade. It's a complete philosophical shift in how SpaceX approaches spaceflight. The integrated hot staging assembly alone represents years of engineering evolution compressed into a single component. But here's what's really mind-blowing. The testing they're doing at Pad 2 suggests capabilities that go far beyond what they've publicly disclosed. Those deluge system tests everyone's been watching? They're not just preparing for Block 3's current thrust levels. The water pressure we're seeing could handle vehicles with significantly more power. This raises a fascinating question. Are we looking at SpaceX preparing for Block 4 capabilities before Block 3 even flies? The timeline acceleration tells the same story, 
Booster 18 construction is moving so fast that industry veterans are questioning whether SpaceX has solved manufacturing bottlenecks that have plagued the program for years. Either they've developed new techniques they're keeping under wraps, or they're operating under pressure we don't fully understand. This manufacturing mystery becomes clearer when we examine what's really happening at Pad 2. The mainstream narrative focuses on basic infrastructure improvements, but the reality is far more ambitious. Those deluge system tests aren't just about water flow. They're about creating a launch environment that can handle whatever SpaceX throws at it for the next decade. The power requirements alone are staggering. We're talking about water systems that can generate pressure levels previously reserved for industrial applications. But why such overkill for current Starship variants? Here's a theory that's gaining traction among engineers. SpaceX isn't just building for today's missions. They're future-proofing for variants that might need significantly more thrust. Variants designed for direct Mars trajectories without orbital refueling. Variants that could make the journey to Mars in weeks instead of months. Sound impossible? Remember, this is the same company that landed rockets when everyone said it couldn't be done. This future-focused approach becomes even more intriguing when we look at the B18.3 test article that's been quietly moved to Massey's. On the surface, it's just another structural test program. But dig deeper, and you'll find details that don't quite add up. This test article features the new integrated hot staging assembly, the same technology that will define Block 3's capabilities. But here's the kicker. The testing timeline suggests they're pushing this hardware far beyond normal parameters. The frosting patterns we're seeing indicate cryogenic testing at extreme pressures. Why would you stress test a component beyond its operational requirements unless you're planning to use it in ways that haven't been publicly announced? Some engineers are whispering about test scenarios that involve rapid relight capabilities, technology that would be essential for Mars surface operations, but unnecessary for Earth orbit missions. This connects back to our earlier question about future proofing. Are we looking at SpaceX secretly developing Mars-specific hardware? These technical developments take on new meaning when you look at the broader market dynamics. SpaceX launched 639 metric tons of payload in Q2 alone, 86% of all global launch capacity. But here's what's terrifying for competitors. That's with Falcon 9 technology. When Starship comes online at full capacity, we're looking at SpaceX potentially controlling 95% or more of global launch market share. That's not competition. That's complete market domination. But this market control reveals something more significant than business success. With that kind of launch capacity, SpaceX could single-handedly build and maintain a Mars colony infrastructure. They wouldn't need partners, government contracts, or international cooperation. They could do it alone. That's not just a business strategy. That's geopolitical power on a scale we've never seen before. And it explains why other nations and companies are scrambling to develop competing capabilities. This power dynamic becomes even more complex when we consider NASA's growing dependence on SpaceX. The Artemis II mission is now scheduled for February 5th, 2026. And SpaceX's timeline acceleration puts them perfectly positioned to support whatever NASA needs. But here's the uncomfortable truth. NASA is no longer driving the timeline. SpaceX is. When a private company can move faster than a government agency with unlimited funding, the traditional power dynamic shifts completely. The recent astronaut selection announcement, including SpaceX's own Anna Manon, sends a clear message. The lines between private industry and government space programs are blurring to the point where they might disappear entirely. This creates a fascinating paradox. NASA needs SpaceX to achieve its goals, but every success makes NASA more dependent on a private company with its own agenda. Understanding SpaceX's dominance becomes clearer when we look at the competition struggles. Blue Origin's recent developments provide a perfect example. Their lunar transporter SunShield represents serious engineering capability. 20 meters of deployable protection with integrated solar arrays generating 23 plus kilowatts. But here's the reality. While Blue Origin is perfecting individual components, SpaceX is revolutionizing entire systems. It's the difference between building a better mousetrap and reinventing pest control. The Viper rover mission assignment to Blue Origin is significant, but it's also telling. 
NASA is spreading risk across multiple providers because they understand that putting all their eggs in the SpaceX basket could create dangerous dependencies. Meanwhile, Sierra Space's Dream Chaser program illustrates how quickly the landscape can shift. After years of development, NASA has essentially downgraded their expectations to a single free flight demonstration. Why? Because SpaceX has moved the goalposts so dramatically that programs developed for yesterday's requirements are obsolete before they launch. This obsolescence becomes stark when you look at recent launch economics. ULA's Atlas V mission, carrying 27 Kuiper satellites, cost over $150 million, more than five times what SpaceX charges for equivalent capability. But here's what's really interesting. Amazon is still using Atlas V for Kuiper deployments, despite having access to SpaceX services. Why? Because Jeff Bezos understands that depending on your primary competitor for launch services is strategic suicide. This decision reveals the true cost of SpaceX's dominance. It's not just about cheaper launches, it's about forcing competitors to make economically irrational decisions just to maintain independence. Against this backdrop of industry upheaval, SpaceX's successful IMAP launch represents something far more significant than just another science mission. It demonstrates their ability to handle complex, high-value payloads with precision timing and orbital accuracy. But here's what the celebration is missing. Missions like IMAP are becoming routine for SpaceX. They're not stretching capabilities anymore. They're demonstrating consistency. That shift from innovation to reliable service delivery marks a crucial inflection point. The IMAP mission's focus on mapping the heliosphere isn't just academic curiosity either. Understanding how solar radiation interacts with our cosmic environment is crucial for long-duration space missions, the kind SpaceX is planning for Mars. Those 30-minute advance warnings about radiation bursts? That's life-or-death information for astronauts beyond Earth's protective magnetosphere. SpaceX isn't just launching this mission. They're funding their own survival manual for Mars colonization. This strategic thinking becomes evident when we return to Starbase and examine the construction pace of Booster 18. They're not just building rockets faster, they're building them differently. The modular construction approach we're seeing suggests they've solved the scalability problem that has plagued rocket manufacturing for decades. When you can build boosters like cars on an assembly line, the entire economics of spaceflight changes. But here's the connection that brings everything full circle. This manufacturing capability isn't just about Earth launches, it's about building infrastructure on Mars using the same techniques. SpaceX isn't just planning to visit Mars. They're planning to industrialize it. And that's why the end of Block 2 matters so much. It's not just the end of a vehicle design. It's the end of the experimental phase. Everything from Block 3 forward is about scaling up for permanent off-world presence. The question isn't whether SpaceX will get to Mars. It's whether anyone else will get there before they've already built a city. This is exactly why SpaceX made such a dramatic pivot after Flight 11. What we witnessed wasn't just the end of Block 2. It was SpaceX shifting from proving they could build rockets to building the foundation for Mars civilization. The rush timeline, over-engineered infrastructure, and manufacturing revolution all serve one goal, making humanity multi-planetary within this decade. While competitors plan individual missions, SpaceX is creating an entire industrial ecosystem for permanent Mars settlement. Block 3 testing begins next month. Pad 2 comes online soon after. The next 18 months will prove whether SpaceX's Mars timeline is realistic or overly ambitious. Either way, we're watching the most aggressive space development program in history unfold in real time. What do you think? Can SpaceX's manufacturing approach actually support a Mars colony by 2030? Are they moving too fast, or is this the pace needed to beat international competition? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If this deep dive analysis helped you understand what's really happening behind SpaceX's strategy, hit that like button. For more breakdowns of space industry developments that mainstream media misses, subscribe to Space Hub and ring the notification bell so you never miss our latest analysis. We're not just watching rocket launches anymore. We're witnessing the birth of interplanetary civilization, and Space Hub will be here to decode every breakthrough along the way.
Blue Origin just landed the ultimate victory against SpaceX. Jeff Bezos secured NASA's $190 million Viper lunar mission as the only selected contractor, while SpaceX didn't even compete. This marks Blue Origin's second major NASA contract, positioning them as a serious lunar player. But here's the twist. When asked if Blue Origin's new Glenn could replace SpaceX on Artemis III, Elon Musk laughed out loud. His confident reaction has the space community buzzing. Why didn't SpaceX bid? What does Musk know that we don't? The data reveals surprising insights. Let's dive right in. To understand why Musk laughed, we need to go back to where this all started. NASA's Viper rover project was heading straight for disaster. Originally budgeted at $200 million, costs exploded to nearly $800 million by July 2024 due to delays with contractor Astrobotic. NASA had no choice but to cancel the entire project. But then something unprecedented occurred. On February 4th, 2025, NASA did something they rarely do. They revived a canceled mission. The question everyone was asking, who could actually deliver? The first attempt to find a contractor failed completely. NASA's initial partnership call in May 2025 attracted zero viable proposals. Zero. This wasn't just embarrassing for NASA. It was a crisis threatening hundreds of millions in taxpayer investment. This is exactly what Jeff Bezos was waiting for. While SpaceX dominated headlines with Starship tests, Blue Origin was quietly positioning itself for this precise moment. When NASA issued the second call for proposals under Task Order CS7, Blue Origin didn't just bid. They were the only company that met all requirements. Think about that. In an industry where multiple companies usually compete for every major contract, Blue Origin stood completely alone. This wasn't luck. This was strategic positioning years in the making. On September 19th, 2025, the results were announced. Blue Origin secured up to $190 million for the Viper mission, scheduled for late 2027. The timing was perfect. Their new Glenn rocket had just completed